Hi everyone, this is Kate at NACTO. We're just waiting for folks to hop on the line and we're going to get started a little after 2 o'clock. Thank you so much for joining us. Just hang tight and we'll be starting soon. Hello. Hey Russell, uh, now's not a good time on the back for the presentation. Um, can I call you later? <laughs> okay. Alrighty, bye-bye. Hi everyone, we're just hanging out here and waiting for folks to, to hop on, so we're going to get started right around 2, so just hang out for a little while longer and we'll get started. Thanks so much for joining us.
Hi, everyone. We're just going to give it one more minute and let the last folks trickle in. Um, and then we're going to go, get, go ahead and get started. Thanks so much. Oh, did you want to see my slides? <laughs> Thanks. Sure. I don't even know where I can. Hi, everybody. Thank you guys for joining us on the uh, station sighting uh, webinar. Uh, we've got a great little uh, conversation going today. Um, so my name is, for those of you who don't know, my name is Kate Delanier. I am the Bike Share Program Director here at NACTO. Um, so I'm going to take you on a whirlwind tour of the new NACTO Bike Share Sighting Guide. Uh, and then after that, you're going to hear from Aaron Ritz and Karnisha Kawashi from the city of Philadelphia and from Paul DeMaio in Arlington who are going to talk about the outreach process and the system expansion planning in their respective cities. Um, a couple of quick logistics before we get started. We are going to go through all the speakers first, and then we're going to open it up to a Q&A afterward. Um, so if you have questions, hold them to the end, or there is a little question interface on the, or question box on the interface screen that comes up with webinar, go to webinar, and you can type questions into there, and we will read them out um, so that folks can answer them at the end. Um, one other thing is that if you are not currently on mute, please put yourself on mute just so we don't have weird feedback coming from all the different various folks on this line. Um, and then last logistical piece, um, if you are looking for a copy of the sighting guide, it is available as a PDF on the NACTA website. Or if you're looking for a bound copy, it is also available on our website for sale. Um, so that's just the logistical back end. Um, all right, now that I've just told you guys all to go on mute, I'm now going to tell you to unmute yourself, and we're going to do quick introductions, um, starting from west to east. Just uh, introduce yourself. Uh, this is Brian Genovese, City of San Diego. Hi, everyone. We're um, just having a little bit of an... Muted. Muted. Okay, uh, 
technical problems that we are having some issues with here. Uh, I take that back about the introductions. Um, I, we are having weird things with our interface here, so we are not going to be able to do introductions right now. We'll figure this out as the webinar goes on so that we can have a good Q&A session at the end. So with that, uh, I'm going to start, and then as I said, we're going to be followed by uh, Aaron Ritz and Karnisha Kwashi from Philadelphia, and then Paul DeMaio from Arlington. So the first thing to say really is thank you to everyone on this list, everyone who's been working um, and helping us over the course of the past eight, non eight months put together this great sighting guide. You know, it really is uh, a product of the input and the assistance coming from all of you in NACTO and the various other cities who are represented on this list, the planners and the advocates, uh, providing information about how things are done in their cities, great images, site drawings, et cetera, that have all come together to, to create this work. Um, all told, the guide create, contains um, 70 photos, 12 tech drawings from about 24 different cities, really showcasing some of the diversity of what bike share systems look like in, this, in the United States. And it's designed to provide a framework for planners to use when they're making decisions and also really help level out that information playing field um, for advocates, really helping support people to understand what, what's being proposed and really make the best decisions about what's happening in their communities. It's organized by typology, uh, stations in the street, stations on the sidewalk, stations in open spaces, and also around some general, imp general principles that really impact how bike share gets used, the overall accessibility of the system, whether or not it's stations are accessible and convenient, how you design them for safety, how to make stations enhancements to the public realm as opposed to detriment, and then how to make sure that they're operationally feasible and really addressed in the sort of larger conversation about how a streetscape hierarchy works. As I said from the beginning, the, the guide really started from the questions happening here on the NACTO list. People looking for examples of how stations might look in different contexts or in different configurations or you know what, what different surfaces do or what happens if you use different street treatments. And the guide is really designed to address many of the sort of basic technical questions that can really make a station or honestly make a bike share system succeed or fail. Uh, how do I make this a location that's safe? What are standard clearances? How close can I be to an intersection? Uh, can I do this here? Is this some, how do I make a station uh, be a place that people want to go? And it provides a pretty wide range of guidance from you know, photos that you can show to elected officials or civic groups or engineers or your neighbors to really explain what's, what's the state of practice in bike share right now. Um, this, for example, is the Divi station in Grant Park in Chicago and it's in front of the Shedd Aquarium, which actually happens to be a historic building, which is often something that gets raised. And then it also goes to, you know, the, the, closer, the closer in look, you know, services, street treatments. How do, these, how do we really get bike share stations onto the ground and into the streetscape? So this, for example, is a bicycle station in Charlotte sitting on a brick sidewalk um, and also really leaving a, a really ample clearance on that sidewalk for pedestrians to walk by. And then the guide also covers uh, technical drawings, as I mentioned, from a variety of different cities, which can really set the floor for you know, what cities can, can and really should expect from the people who are doing their site drawings. And so this example is a, is a bike share plaza in New York City. It closes a slip road, re sort of regularizes out that intersection, and makes it safer, safer and easier for pedestrians to cross. And then the station itself really anchors that plaza, it creates that plaza and adds a level of vibrancy and activity. One of the things that we think is the most valuable about the guide is that it really helps focus on the question of how the station placement choices that we're making can help further other station or other safety goals that a city might have. You know, in particular, one of the things we know is that low-income people, people of color, are disproportionately affected by traffic violence. And so as planners and also as advocates, you know, we really need to think strategically about the way we put bike share st stations down on the street and if making sure that we're doing that in ways that can help make streets safer for everyone. You know, everyone here knows that cities have limited resources. Um, and so allowing and figuring out ways to make bike share stations do sort of a double duty to simultaneously, you know, be a place for bike share and also 
define out bicycle and pedestrian space, or narrow up traffic lanes, or create medians in pedestrian refuge islands, shorten crossing distances. All of these things can really make a difference larger than bike sharing in, in the overall safety of your city. So this is an example actually from Austin. It is a paint, painted curb extension that is really protected and defined out by that bike share, so that bicycle station in the back. The other thing to realize is that bike share stations can really be a catalyst for sort of bigger changes and some real dramatic safety improvements. So this is a photo of Park Avenue leading up to Grand Central Station in New York City. Um, in looking for a bike share station location that was really big enough to accommodate the demand here, um, the planners approached the local business improvement district who was looking for a while for ways to you know, create a better, a safer, a more pedestrian friendly entrance to Grand Central. And so what ended up happening is a street closure, um, closed, closed the street to cars, um, and this is actually the most popular city bike station in the system, and it's a really dramatic and really meaningful en enhancement to a very, very busy area. You know, Paul is actually going to talk about some of this in a, in a minute, but Smart planners can really use siting to, to help push on other safety enhancements, and it doesn't always have to be huge. So this is a curb extension in Arlington. Uh, the sidewalk clearly not wide enough. Um, and so the curb extension um, was created for the bike chair station, but at the same time, it shortened up that crossing distance for pedestrians. So two for the price of one right there. And then again in New York, sort of thinking about ways you can push the envelope uh, and create, or and sort of be creative in your siting and sort of thinking through a larger conversation about what people are looking for from their neighborhoods. Um, in this neighborhood, the community wanted DOT to address a bunch of speeding issues on this incredibly wide street. And so uh, DOT came back and said, you know, we can put a bike chair station in that painted median. It's connected up to the crosswalk at, at the edges. Um, and what they saw was a, a huge reduction in U-turns, very much clearer definition out of the lanes and where people are supposed to be, shorter crossing distances for pedestrians, and generally a safer and a slower road environment for everyone there. So there is so much more to talk about on bike share. Um, Karnisha and Aaron are going to tell you about Philadelphia. Paul is going to tell you about Arlington. Two things I just want to flag and put on your radar, one being the Better Bike Share Partnership Conference in June in Philadelphia. It's going to be a great conference really sort of talking about the, the bigger issues of how do we make inclusive, meaningful, equitable bike share that you know all of us are grappling with. Grappling with. And then the NACTA Designing Cities Conference in September in Seattle. We're actually working on developing content now and are trying to figure out, um, sort of design out a, a really good panel feature that really takes a look at the bike share site planning process and outreach process. So two things to really put on your radar. I highly encourage you to, to come to both if you can. And with that, I am going to head, hand this over to the folks in Philadelphia. Hi, folks. This is Hi. Aaron Ritz. And Karnisha Kwashi. And our silent partner today is Kara <laughs> Ferentino, who um, in a lot of ways masterminded uh, the whole program and also this particular presentation and then fell mute. Uh, she's got. Um, Great. Can everybody see the screen? Can anybody hear me? Yes, we can see the screen. Awesome. Great. <laughs> double, double good. Um, so uh, all three of us are here. Um, Karnish and I will do the talking because Kara unfortunately has laryngitis today, but we're going <laughs> to make fun of her a lot because um, she can't talk back. But thanks again, Kate, for the opportunity, and we're going to kind of breeze through some things. And we'll go slideshow. Uh, from the beginning. All right. Great. So I think um, you know, as we've planned our system, a lot of it is about minimizing pitfalls and maximizing opportunities. That's kind of a pretty basic strategy. But I think a lot of it, uh, particularly in a city like Philadelphia, where um, we're a we're a poor city, we're a, a fairly low income in as far as bike sharing city peers, um, and when we talk about adding something like bike share, which is which can be seen as a frill or a you know non necessity, we have to answer questions like you know why why is bike share something that the city should be doing? Uh, this is something for those other people. This isn't for people like me. Um, and you want to make sure you're not not just placing them in the places that are the easiest uh, to see from a map, but also the ones that 
are most useful when we're talking about um, the communities. And the idea of making it and building it into something that people feel is their bike share station, um, something that's valuable to the, to the uh, organizations, to the, the people that live in a place, something that makes sense from a, to, the, to the folks actually using it, living in the communities, and connecting with other city services. And I'll, I'll let uh, Kanisha talk about that in a little bit. And I think also recruiting local champions. You know, it, it's one thing for people from the city to come into a community meeting and say, bike share is this thing that's going to be great for you. We're sure of it. And it's totally different to have um, somebody coming in from the community saying, I heard about bike share. I met with these folks. They seem legit to me. And this is what they are proposing. Let's, let's give them a listen. Um, that's, that's really kind of how we think about it, is trying to get local folks really engaged and hopefully uh, pointing us to the, the best locations for their communities. All right. Um, step one. Step one is do your research. And this is something um, I think we had, uh, we are late to the game as far as bike share goes. And as a result, I think we actually had a little bit of an advantage because we've been We'd been out in communities for um, literally over the course of two years, telling people that bike share was coming, telling them that it was, you know, what it was, how it might work, and then also in the meantime, other cities in our region had brought bike share, and folks that had traveled to say New York or Boston or Washington D.C. or Charlotte or any of the other cities had seen it around and were kind of were familiar with the concept. Um, and then it's also important to really kind of figure out who who the people in your organization, whether that's city government, whether that's uh, the nonprofit realm, who's in the know, who knows who you should be talking to, and then use that as, as kind of an entry point. And I'll let Karnisha talk about some of the types of relationships that we, or the, the types of people we sought to meet with at first. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, good afternoon everyone. Again, my name is Karnisha Kwashi, and I'm the Better Bike Share Partnership Grant Manager. Um, so I over, it's a national initiative led by the city of Philadelphia to promote um, bike share being socially equitable uh, throughout our nation. Uh, NACTO is one of our partners, and so this guide is a part of that partnership, which is a JPB Foundation initiative. Um, to start off, one of the things that we did in terms of doing our research, too, was to make sure that we were aligning ourselves with resources in the community uh, that were already serving the people that we tried to reach and successfully serving them. Um, and so one of the first things that we did in doing the research, not just talking with the local NACs and CDCs, neighborhood uh, associations and councils and uh, community development corporations, but we also wanted to attach ourselves to uh, agencies here within our city. Uh, for instance, uh, the Mayor's Commission on Literacy as well as the Office of Civic Engagement, folks who were already reaching lower income uh, folks and community, communities of color throughout our city. That was really important for us to do from the beginning, to align ourselves with them, to leverage our resources with them, and to first and foremost see if we had uh, common goals. And of course we do because we're, still, we're, we're servants, we're public servants. So um, that's something you know, we would encourage everyone to do too throughout their process. I think that the next part is you know, based off of that, that first outreach is you know, meeting folks and establishing the relationships. You know, and that that um, starts as some as something as simple as like being at a street fair with a bike to show people, and then you meet the folks who are engaged in their community out at the events, and then really building from that. You know, meeting person to person, uh, sharing the info, and I think an important point here is to make the expectations clear. Um, we're not. Uh, we're not able to solve uh, any number of different things with uh, bikes and stations, but what we can do is add to programs that are already existing, uh, provide resources for organizations that are interacting with their communities on a daily basis, and you know, being clear up front what you've got to offer is important, and making sure that 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 is really um, what you're leading with, rather than false hopes or false expectations, or um, you know. Uh, we're here with bikes and we can fix everything with them because uh, folks will know that that's false uh, straight off the bat and that's not how you want to be approaching it. Mm -hmm. Yep, and, and uh, that's Karen and I at the top. <laughs> we were at an event called Strawberry Mansion Day six months before we uh, initiated uh, the site planning conversations with the community. So the other thing that should be emphasized is that these kind of partnerships take time. 
Um, they take time and they, they take a lot of the communities leading those conversations up front. Yeah, and then Sarah's talking to us. <laughs> yeah, we're getting our crib notes in the back. Um, once you've met folks out out at events and got sort of that initial excitement, the next thing is to really follow up with the community and making sure that you're presenting to you know the most engaged of the, of the citizens who are at the community meetings and really leading with the question, you know, is this program something that's interesting to you? And then sort of see where folks are at, and then hopefully there's at least somebody who thinks it's it's interesting or useful. And you know, kind of just presenting it as something. Hey, we want to know if this is right for you. This is in other neighborhoods. We don't want to. We don't want to put you on the back burner on the sideline. We want to offer this as a as a service to your community. How can this best serve you? And I think that's the next question. How can this serve your community? Where do you see this in your in your community? And then, you know, many folks are concerned with things that are not not related to bikes. But as in our position, we're at the city, so we. We'll try to also uh, connect with resources, and I think Carnesha can talk a little yeah. bit about uh, job placements, for example. Yeah. So, for instance, um, you know, if we go to a community meeting, we ask, you know, what are the top priorities for your community at this time? Uh, where are a lot of your resources going? Uh, what are a lot of the common issues that are going on with the residents that represent this neighborhood? So, a lot of times we get jobs. You know, workforce development is a major priority for communities. So, as public servants, what we do is we go back and we talk to those workforce agencies that represent, um, that work for the city or, or other agencies and then bring those resources to the community members, letting them know about job training programs and job opportunities and really organizations that can help them with the, with the citizens that they're concerned about. Yeah, and you know, a lot of people kind of come at a, a program as, a, as a, a, perhaps a skeptical neighbor might come at the program as like, is this a source for jobs? This is a source for access to social services, and uh, in some cases it is, but it really, um, bike share is a lean operation, as all of you out there know, and um, it, it can't alone hire enough people to really make a, a dent in employment in a community, but what we can do is connect folks with the resources that are already available, and in many cases, you know, use that to potentially staff um, uh, the bike share team in the future, but really recognizing what you can do as an organization, as a bike share organization, and then um, making sure you're linking folks with the appropriate resources available. And then, you know, this is, this is kind of the, this can be the fun part, this can be the challenging part, but just being out there and walking the sites with community leaders. Uh, this is a picture from a site visit that Kara did earlier this spring out in West Philadelphia. And, you know, actually being on site with people, and uh, if you've ever done this, you would have, you probably know that folks uh, have a lot of spots where they think bike share is a great and great and is going to fit just perfectly. And then when you actually get out there, um, you know that the actual physical details of it needs sunshine, it needs this many feet of sidewalk space. That really gets people's. Um, there's a lot of head scratching that goes on, and then you really can engage them and, and really find the great spots. Um, this is uh, some place where we hope to place bike share in the next uh, week or so, actually. And then. The last kind of piece of that is not just finding the spots and, and calling it a day, but really following up and uh, presenting these findings back to the community. You know, kind of this is your last uh, chance before a station might go in to, to hear about, you know, the, the person who just found out about this and has um, got some real concerns or has some concerns that you can address by just listening and, and being present and responsive in a meeting. And, uh, you know, always, uh, you know, working in government, uh, our bosses, Hate surprises, and that's not any different from uh, the community leaders themselves. Like nobody really wants to be the last one to find out that a bike share station is coming to the front of their property or to a uh, park that they work so hard to maintain. You know, making sure that they're engaged and they know when stuff is coming and what sort of things are available is pretty important. All right, and with that, um, things to note: process not always linear. You know, we're I think at um, working with the the Philadelphia Zoo, we're at site like five or six uh, out of you know, and it takes rounds and rounds uh, sometimes to get the right spot. But by taking the time to do this, you come up with sites that are not only better for um, better for the users of bike share, but also better for the long term relationships. You know, this is something that comes in quickly and you know uh, can go away quickly if there's not support. Um, we're always looking to build the long term relationships, and if that means uh, 
you know, taking it easy and holding off for a couple of months while a, a hospital or some sort of big institution takes their time to decide, that's worth it because they'll be your advocates in the long run to support uh, the system and hopefully help it grow over a long time. And you know, you know this, we know this, it takes time, it takes energy, and uh, it's in a lot of different ways. And uh, you know, just be prepared to have those uncomfortable conversations. Um, you know, I often say if you're not uncomfortable, then you're not doing your job. Um, you know, social equity, um, which is a priority for our city, a priority for the Better Bike Share Partnership, it requires us all to be uncomfortable and um, move beyond our, our boundaries that we came into this, this process and this project with before. So you're going to have the, you know, concerned citizens who, you know, just don't like you because somebody came and did the same dance and tune before and they really don't care what you have to say. Um, and you have to be okay with that and stay encouraged and continue to press forward, identify champions, but also, you know, make sure that they feel empowered too, because these are their communities. Um, and so just be prepared to have those conversations. And really, it's all about connection and relationships. No business, no process succeeds without positive and effective and good, long-lasting relationships. And that's what we're trying to do here through our community partners, through our vendors. We're trying to really establish good relationships continuous engagement, continuous refinement of our efforts, um, and continuing to, to elevate the value of the concerned citizens and the communities that they represent because they should be empowered and be making decisions along with you, planning with you. And uh, one of our community ambassadors says either you're being planned for or you're planning. And a lot of these communities don't like to be planned for, so you must plan and partner with them. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Well, I guess we'll take questions at the end. Thanks, Kate, and thanks, everyone, for uh, taking the time. Uh, hi, everyone. So uh, the way that the questions are going to work, just quickly before we uh, move on to Paul, is if you can type your questions into the questions box, um, either now or at the end, uh, we will go through those and uh, address them through that uh, medium. So please, any questions, type it into the questions box and we will field those at the end. Um, and with that, I'm uh, going to hand it over to Paul. So take it away, Paul. Hey, uh, Paul, I think you might have yourself on, on mute. Uh, I don't think anybody can, can hear you right now. So if you could, could unmute yourself, that'd be great. All right. OK. Can folks hear me? <laughs> uh, yep, it's working. Yeah. OK, great. Now, can folks see my screen? Also, also working. Fantastic. All right, we're already off to a great start here. So uh, hello, everyone. My name is Paul DeMeo. I, uh, am, I do work for Arlington County, Virginia. And um, first thing I'm going to talk about today is a uh, uh, protected bike lane that we are doing here in Arlington. And for those who have never been to Arlington before, there we go. Clear up my screen just a little bit. Uh, so here is the National Mall in DC. And Arlington is just to the west. And I'm going to zoom in on a neighborhood in Arlington called Crystal City. So we're just across the Potomac River. There's the Pentagon on the top of the screen. And here is, uh, here is Crystal City, uh, a neighborhood of Arlington again. And um, this, uh, this corridor here is Eads, South Eads Street. Uh, we had bike lanes there, and the, uh, our transportation engineering and operations folks are uh, converting the bike lanes into a protected bike lane um, that currently stretches the, uh, the length of what is highlighted here in, in uh, bright green uh, and working, working their way north to, uh, to the interstate and then eventually not for the purpose of bikes, <laughs> uh, but eventually to uh, to the Pentagon, which hopefully will it at some point we'll have a station at. They, they've been a, a tough nut to crack, but we'll, we will get there. Um, so with uh, 
with this bike share station, let me actually show you what it looked like previously. So this is what it looked like when we had uh, bike lanes and sharrows on the street. Uh, here is, is Eads and here's the station. And about, let's see, about a year and a half ago, um, we put in we put in protected bike lanes, and this is what it looks like at the intersection. And as you can see, we've got um, uh, we've got hatching on the uh, the motor vehicle side of the station, and delineators with uh, retroreflective tape at the top uh, every every couple of feet, and and then the bike lane on the uh, on the right. And here's another view from the from the north. A uh, little bit easier to tell what's going on here. Um, you can possibly see the protected bike lane continuing. I'm, I'm circling the area uh, south where the uh, where the station uh, or where the where the protected bike lane comes from. We have a couple intersections here, so um, it's uh, uh, it's it's highlighted where the bicycle what, where the bicycle is supposed to go um, to make it through here. So this was great in in getting the first example uh, of a bike share station at a protected bike lane in Arlington. Um, the ridership stayed about the same, maybe up a couple percentage points during that first year. Uh, but as the site, as the protected bike lane continues northward, uh, we'll be able to get a better sense of of its success. So um, I wanted to show this as a uh, as an example of of what we have done so far. And um, also, let me show. Um, we've got an example here of a couple innovative. Um, uh, sites. Uh, this site here is in a park. Uh, actually, uh, a lot of a lot of our sites, I'd probably I'd probably say maybe ten to ten to fifteen percent of our stations are in parks in Arlington. And um, what we've been doing in some locations is using Flexi Pave, which is a uh, an asphalt and recycled rubber content material that allows water to uh, to percolate through. So we have a couple instances here, and you can kind of tell maybe by this photo um, there's some kind of granularity uh, to the um, to the surface, uh, more so than what typical asphalt would have. So uh, the material has a bit of a, a bounciness to it. So we've been we've used that at a couple instances, and also we we had an instance here uh, near one of our metro stations in Pentagon City. Uh, adjacent to Crystal City, where there were already pavers uh, along the sidewalk, and we put it this, we put the station on top of the pavers, um, and as you can see, that some of the grass is is um, making its way through, so uh, it helps out with with percolation of water. Um, I, I think the the holy grail is is finding you know a really environmentally friendly solution uh, for bike share station locations and. Um, you know, stuff like this certainly is not inexpensive, but uh, it does help out a lot with um, uh, with with lowering the uh, environmental footprint of our stations, which are usually on concrete pads that were formerly grass, or um, in some cases are on street. Uh, and and you know, we're not we're not making the environmental uh, we're not worsening the situation, but we're certainly not improving it. Um, so a couple examples there. Uh, I also wanted to talk about Arlington's um, station implementation process. So we have a, a process similar to Philly's that, um, let me see, let me open up the document here. Uh, actually, I'll open up this one first. Um, so we have, we've got a multi-step process for uh, both uh, public property and private property. Um, the public property, Public property process is is quite long. You know, starts everything from the the research, uh, multi step as you can see, eventually to putting the station on our dash, dashboard once it's live. Um, but it includes all of the the neighborhood processes and um, uh, working with uh, our internal departments, and uh, it's a quite a long process. Um, one thing that I wanted to point out that we do in in Arlington, we have something called the Arlington Way, and it's a very uh, community community oriented uh, approach, which I'm, I'm I know a lot of communities have. Uh, for some reason, we've named it, <laughs> um, but it is it's really a, a tremendous way of doing things where. We meet with the community multiple times. Um, we we notify the um, 
the homeowners or adjacent uh, property owners uh, when um, when we're proposing a station and then eventually when the station is going to be uh, installed. Um, but one thing that we found early on was that, you know, in going to the Civic Association meetings, we were, we were reaching a very small portion of the overall community. And when we're trying to get a, a very broad support for the bike share station uh, or proposed site, plus trying to get people interested in using Capital Bike Share, uh, we, we really had to broaden what we were doing and, and the outreach and getting input. Because um, oftentimes the, the folks that were showing up to the Civic Association were not representing the entire neighborhood. It was a very small um, subset of the neighborhood. And, and, and uh, so in order to broaden our reach, um, part of what we do now and started about a year and a half ago uh, was create a survey. So in, in addition to meeting with the Civic Association, we send out a link to the survey, which is a, a, Google, a Google survey, um, where we get a sense of uh, what street the uh, resident lives on, whether or not they've used Capital Bike Share before, and some information about where the site would uh, be located, and some um, aerial and footprint photos showing where the site is being proposed. So um, this site here um, off of uh, Lee Highway, one of our uh, state-owned uh, major corridors, uh, an arterial that runs through Arlington. And um, we can get a sense of whether or not people like or do not like the location, um, why they feel that way, and any other thoughts about the, the bike share system in general. Uh, and, and this really helps us uh, you know, get that broader sense um, we, we do use this to tweak the location. Um, oftentimes, uh, neighbors, well, certainly neighbors know their, their neighborhood better than we do. Um, so we've gotten a lot of great ideas uh, if the proposed site does not work, or possibly how to um, uh, reconfigure the proposal to limit the, uh, the parking impact, or to, um, uh, yeah, I guess just uh, it, it make any improvements that the neighborhood may have. Uh, and, and this data is um, provided to us in a, uh, a Google um, Excel type spreadsheet. Uh, so um, we've, we've, I would say, tripled or quadrupled the um, amount of responses that we get. And also this gives an opportunity for people who are um, maybe on the, uh, on the quieter side at uh, public meetings who, who don't often share input, but they're there to absorb. But this, this, this gives them the say so that they can provide uh, further input um, and, uh, and, and allow more time to think about uh, what we're proposing rather than a 10-minute presentation. So, um, so that's been quite helpful. And um, also wanted to briefly talk about uh, our private property process. We, have, we do have multiple locations on private property in Arlington. Um, and uh, the, the private property process is, is pretty much the public process. However, we have some, let's see, some sections here of the process. And I, I don't expect everyone to be able to, to read this. But um, basically, we, um, we work with the private property owner to have them provide a letter of consent and a, uh, a disclosure statement um, describing uh, who the company is and, and who it's, uh, if it's a large company, who its shareholders are. And, um, and then also uh, we have them sign a, uh, uh, a use permit or site plan amendment application. Uh, the county then, we, we then uh, handle this on our side, have our zoning uh, uh, department review this information and eventually uh, it goes to our county board. And we have to have a license agreement with the uh, the private property owner as well. So, um, whereas uh, I, I think Aaron and Carnesha were saying that you know it it, it is a long process uh, for for public property sites for us in Arlington could be anywhere from if we're lucky you know four five six months. Um, if we're not lucky uh, for public could be a, a year or more. Um, for private, could could be a year at the very minimum, and the uh, the county board process certainly takes takes uh, uh, much of that time. You know the internal process, um, but getting the the private property owner signing everything and and keeping things moving along 
is uh, of the utmost importance to um, uh, to a, a quick implementation of of uh, of the site. So um, I, I see I'm I'm just over ten minutes here, so I'm going to uh, finish my presentation right there and uh, look forward to your all's questions. Great, thanks so much, Paul. Um, so uh, we're opening up to questions right now. Uh, please type them into the questions box. We currently have one question that I am going to read, and um, this doesn't have uh, who who the question is directed towards. So I'm going to read it, and then people are going to choose who's going to answer it. Um, the city of Ventura is looking to do a public-private bike share. Uh, they are about to begin the conversations with their private stakeholders. Would you recommend also beginning conversations with community councils before we figure out funding? And if so, what questions to start with? So, anybody please? So I think, I think Karnisha and the Philly team would be, I'm going to you know, put you guys on the hot spot here. This is Kate. Um, but I will also just start in on this question just to say, yes, definitely. Um, I think the earlier you can get out talking to people about bike share and getting them excited about the concept and what it can mean for them in terms of their day-to-day -day mobility and how they, they get around and, and the things it can bring as a benefit to their community, um, the better the better you are. Um, and really sort of gauging from people what they want to see from bike share, not just what you think it's going to do for them, but how they can imagine using it themselves. Um, but I think Karnisha or Aaron, you guys want to hop in? Yeah. Hi, Lisa. I think that was uh, from you. Um, but I think uh, we definitely agree that getting in front of the community early is great. And I think one of the important points that you can communicate early as you're going down the road of a public-private partnership is, is really kind of describing what that means and describing what the community's role might be in planning kind of regardless. You're going to need their input for station siting because um, that's, that's going to be more effective and more appropriate. But also just kind of uh, informing folks that uh, the basic message is nobody gets rich on bike share, and um, the reason that you need public-private partnership is to to fund things. It's not going to um, be a cash cow. It's going to be just just kind of describing that as part of the the system, and kind of describing and bringing them in, in to be involved in that. Um, maybe not the decision making process for the the who, but the decision making process for how they'll be later integrated into community. Yeah, and I would just add, you know, another important factor if if you're you know, if you have the option to do this, are uh, is to do focus groups. Um, we collaborate with Temple University's Institute for Survey Research. So, along with doing all of the community meetings, engaging council, uh, engaging state rep offices, and whatnot, we also engaged folks um, and did a focus group, which helped us determine pricing, um, where people should go, where people could could pay for the memberships, because we were the first city to launch with the cash payment option. So, if you can do it, do focus groups as well, because that will also help you um, in your efforts to pre uh, create a socially equitable system. You might even be able to, uh, to work with a local university to get something um, you know, very low cost or even free as a, as a kind of a donated uh, yeah. service. You know, perhaps a marketing department or, or anything at a, at a local university might be a good, good yeah. source there. Yeah, I do like to give people how much it costs. So it did cost us $20,000. <laughs> Um, but there was a lot of work that was put put behind it uh, with the university. So if you you know we can we're certainly willing to share that information. It is already available. But um, Kate and Ted, if you want to hook us up with folks, we can give them a breakdown of what that scope of work included. Definitely, we will send out all the information at, at, after the call. Um, so the next question we've got is let's see. Um, the benefits of station serving dual purposes, bike share and pedestrian safety improvements, how do you balance between the permanent improvements and the flexibility of stations as they move or expand? And is there a preference in your approach when working with communities? Um, so I'll start that one and anyone else if you guys want to hop in. Um, I, I think that, you know, at least in the New York context, stations move, but they don't move that much. Um, they move for special events, they move for construction and that, and that set of events, but it's not like a day-to-day a -day movement. Um, and so one of the interesting things with the Pershing Square example is that there was actually work on a larger capital project to do 
another a pedestrian plaza with seating on Pershing Square is this funny thing where there's a viaduct down the middle of Park Avenue and so there's a uh, essentially a northbound and a southbound that are two completely separate streets um, and so there was a plan for the southbound lanes to turn that into a, a public plaza um, and that's been a capital project that's been in the works for honestly five years now um, and we saw the opportunity on the northbound lanes to, to put in the bike share station and, and do it in paint, um, which made it so much faster. We actually at some point in time had to move that station because of some other construction. Uh, the station was gone for mm, four or five months and then came back. You know, so one of the nice things about the flexibility of stations is it allows you to accommodate, you know, other things that are happening around you in terms of construction, road work, what have you. Um, but really allows you to then come back to to the to putting the station in a place that makes the road safer. With the other station that was in the middle of the median um, in the really, really wide street, that's actually something that's gotten built into a capital program, a capital project later. And so they're building the capital pieces around that station and the station really sort of started the trend in terms of narrowing up that street and making it safer for people. So really sort of but I think part of the other portion of your question sort of addressing by I mean not everyone is going to ride a bike share bike, but everyone uses the street and there are ways that bike share stations themselves can be beneficial to everyone, be it making the street safer or if you're doing wayfinding and maps, making a map that everyone can use. So if you're walking around and you're lost, you know where to go. I mean, there are a bunch of ways that you can broaden the benefit of bike share beyond people who bike and, you know, using bike share as, as a road safety tool is, is definitely one of those. If I can add to that, um, in Arlington, we, uh, as, as part of our station implementation process, we meet with um, uh, our uh, transit and uh, transportation planning folks as part of the process, as well as our transportation engineering and operations folks. And um, through that process, we, we get a good understanding of, of what they're working on, um, you know, what projects they're working on, what, uh, uh, what opportunities we have to partner with them. Uh, in the case of transit, uh, who, who focus on uh, buses and, and our metro rail system, we have improved uh, with them uh, bus shelter locations that, um, that are in need of improvement and elongated them so that we can uh, add a bike share station to. And then in, in that one example that, um, that Kate showed earlier, uh, which was actually from Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, they uh, uh, it also narrows the sidewalk, uh, so it, uh, it it creates a lesser uh, a shorter crossing distance. So there there's so many opportunities, and we're always looking for those opportunities in uh, in our siting for for every station. Uh, this is Aaron chiming in, and it seems like we're we're really um, in our first year. We really didn't do much as far as site improvement. We are starting on some of those things now, and the way that it seems to prioritize it for those who have to prioritize is to do those things that you would probably want to do even without, even absent bike share so that um, it just makes sense even if the station has to move or is moved at a later date. You know, the one that Paul just mentioned, a road, uh, road narrowing or a bump out, those types of things have universal benefit or broader benefit than just putting a bike share station on them. But if you can, if you can double down and add it to a bus shelter as we are considering uh, in this next phase or um, closing off a, a slip ramp to a more of a residential street. You know, we're looking into those types of things where it's a good idea and it's been requested at the community and uh, bike share also fits there, but it's not always the driving factor. Great. Um, so the next question coming um, is um, talking actually about the, the private property process. Um, and this is coming from Pittsburgh, and they say, um, is the lengthy private process, private property process a result of the public-private partnership model of Arlington? Um, Pittsburgh is working on expansion right now, but wasn't anticipating such a long time period for installation, and so was just sort of curious what's happening there. Um, I will say from, again, New York, that the length of um, getting permission to use private property varies very, very dramatically from city to city. Um, in New York, it was literally just a, a space license agreement between 
the private property owner and the operator of the system. So the city was not involved in that way. So it was actually as long as it took for people to agree on a three-page contract. Um, but different cities vary. So Paul, I don't know if you want to elaborate on. Sure. I, I would be surprised if, if any jurisdiction in the country had a longer process than us. <laughs> it, is, it, it really is insane um, how long it takes, but um, it is a very thorough process. And, um, and through that, we're getting uh, input and through uh, you know our zoning and our planning folks, and then eventually the county board. So um, it is it, it is a result of the public private private partnership that we have for Capital Bike Share. Um, I would I would imagine for a nonprofit, uh, just working being able to work directly with the private property owner and uh, you know putting station on their property once once a, an agreement, uh, whether formal. or or informal were worked out, I, I would guess that would be a, a much quicker process, but um, it, it sounds like it may not be so. Uh, this is Aaron again, and it's uh, more similar to the situation Kate described in, here in, in Philadelphia. So the city is the owner of all the equipment, but we work with bicycle transit systems to kind of manage that and the all that's needed between a private property owner uh, to place a, a station there is a license agreement with the, that between the two parties, so the private property owner and then our system operator. And you know, we actually, the city reviews those contracts and in some cases uh, opines on them, but it's relatively quick. It can be, you know, if you got somebody who's really motivated to have a bike share station there, it could be a week um, that's a turn for the permission. Cool. We got a bunch of questions in less than enough time. Um, so next question up is, where did it go? Um, can the Philly folks tell us if they have had to move or relocate existing stations from last year? Uh, did you charge private properties for this? How do, basically, how does this work and what are about temporary moves and requests? And somebody else in a similar vein asks, can anyone speak to temporary or emergency moves? And do you have any formalized or abbreviated process for doing things quickly in response to an event or construction? We've had uh, three three real concerns that have caused us to move stations. The first one was Beyonce, the second, the Pope, and the third was uh, construction projects. And um, you know, in the case of public festivals, such as uh, I believe it's called the Made in America Festival, you know, that's when Beyonce made us move our station, in that case, we did charge them the relocation fee. Uh, it's kind of the cost of, of moving it, and we potentially could charge the cost of storing it. That's just to disincentivize people from incurring costs to us. As far as construction, um, you know, in many cases, that's public uh, construction, so we've, we've accommodated that. We kind of budget in for those types of costs on an on a basis, on an annual basis. You're going to need to move some stations. It's just, just how the world works. Um, uh, for example, our title sponsor is Independence Blue Cross. Uh, they're doing construction on the facade of their house, and you know that's something we need to include in our annual budget. We need to be able to pull that station for a temporary period and then put it back in. That's just kind of part of doing business. Yeah, we have not had to move stations as a result of uh, people just not liking it, and um, fortunately, that's I think that's a result of people not. Uh, being really aware of what's coming to their neighborhoods because we've done a very long outreach process. Yeah, I would hop in here and say that um, the New York process for station moves is sounding relatively similar to, to Philadelphia. There's a pretty strict line between things that are public moves, so if you have to repave a road or you know the local utilities need to get in, um, and those are, are covered by the operator, or if it's private construction or a film crew or that sort of thing is covered by the by the private property. And then in terms of emergency uh, moves, there's actually a process set up between uh, NYPD and the operators so that they are in direct communication if there were to be something dramatic like a water main break or a fire or a reason why um, emergency equipment needed to stage in the location where the bike share station was or something happened specifically at that location. Uh, next question up is, how can bike share systems become available to unbanked and underbanked populations?
All right, say that once more. Uh, how can uh, bike share systems become available to unbanked and underbanked populations? Shifting topic slightly here, but it seems like something that you guys would be, Philadelphia would be excellent at answering. Sure. Well, <laughs> thanks. Um, so one, one, one of the things that we did here in Philadelphia through our focus group study is first assess and find out the ways in which folks who are either unbanked or underbanked would prefer to pay for bike share memberships. And so through a series of community engagement exercises, it was determined that it would be best um, to use a vendor called Pay Near Me. Um, and Pay Near Me is a national uh, organization that works with uh, different folks, municipalities, uh, Spotify, and other folks to provide services to unbanked and underbanked individuals. So here in the city of Philadelphia, uh, the vendors that Pay Near Me works with are 7-Eleven, Family Dollar, and Ace Check Cashing. And so our members are able to uh, pay for their memberships once they sign up online uh, at either of uh, those vendors throughout our city of Philadelphia. What we found is, is that the cash uh, payment uh, passes or members, we're, we're, we're changing over the way we, uh, we say things, passes. Those passes um, are usually purchased by a more diverse group of folks, so lower income folks and more folks of color uh, purchase cash um, payments, uh, the cash payment option more so than a white person or a higher income person. What we've also found is, is that that lessens the barrier to actually accessing the system. So in a couple months, once they test the system and see how it works out, a lot of those users actually convert over to uh, registering their debit or credit cards uh, into uh, our Indigo system. So in terms of servicing the unbanked or underbanked, again, we recommend that you, if you can, do some focus groups. Talk to community members and organizations that deal with unbanked and underbanked folks if that's not an option for you. You can always do a focus group and help those people uh, and have those folks help you develop a tool uh, that can, um, you know, get the feedback and input from community members um, who you see could potentially use that system. And I think that's the, really the best way to handle it is to make sure that it's convenient. So people want convenience. Uh, what we found, they want to be able to talk to someone in person, um, so they want that human interaction, and they want to make sure that they're paying for cash payment uh, passes where they're already making purchases. So you'll be able to find out more about these wonderful, <laughs> wonderful uh, conversations and topics that we have around integrating uh, practices and strategies at the Better Bike Share Partnership National Conference hosted by the City of Philadelphia um, here uh, June 22nd through the 24th. We are just about out of time. We are getting actually a bunch of questions coming in on uh, cash and pay near me and how that all works. Um, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to put another webinar on the calendar in the next couple of weeks, um, really looking a little deeper at this cash question. And then again, definitely to echo what Karnisha said, definitely, definitely think about attending the Better Bike Share Partnership Conference in Philadelphia at the end of June. Um, so any other last questions on citing? If not, thank you guys so much. Um, I want to get us out of here so uh, right at 3 o'clock, so we're not wasting anybody's time. This was a great conversation. Um, we will send out the resources that Karnisha mentioned about uh, focus groups um, uh, in a little while. And again, the guide itself is on the NACTA website. Uh, please feel free to go take a look at that. And thank you, everybody, for a great conversation. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. Bye. See you in June. Thanks, guys.